What we must be really careful of as clinicians is that a person's ACE history doesn't close us off to a holistic view of that individual. Hello, I'm David Trickey. I'm a consultant clinical psychologist and co-director of the UK Trauma Council, which is a project where we bring together the leading child trauma experts from around the UK and try and produce resources and guidance for policymakers and professionals on the front line working with children, young people and families who have experienced traumatic events. Uh, today, in this research to practice video, we're going to talk about the implications for practice of the ever-increasing body of research concerning adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. I'm joined by two professors of child and adolescent psychiatry, Professor Helen Minnis from the University of Glasgow and Professor Andrea Danesi from King's College London. So I'm gonna ask each of you a few questions if that's okay. So it's hard to be a practitioner in child mental health and not have come across the term adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. But Helen, I wonder if we'd start by you explaining exactly what ACEs are. So ACEs were defined by an American team more than two decades ago as, on the one hand, abuse and neglect, and on the other hand, they called family dysfunction. And those family dysfunctions could be uncommon things like having a father in prison or a mother in prison or a parent with a severe mental illness, or they could be very common things like divorce. Um, and that the simplicity of it is that it's basically a checklist of usually 10 items, including that whole range of adversities in childhood. Andrea, could you explain to us a bit more exactly how ACEs are measured and if there are any problems with that? Sure. Um, so we typically measure ACEs retrospectively. Um, that is, as in the uh, paper that Helen just mentioned, um, we ask adults, and very rarely children, to recall their childhood history. Um, we then assume that those retrospective recalls, uh, those memories really, are exact measures of what could have, we could have measured prospectively. Uh, for example, uh, from child protection or medical records, or asking parents, for example. Um, but we have shown in a set of papers that uh, that's not really the case. So prospective and retrospective measures um, of ACEs identify two groups that uh, really don't quite overlap. So this might be surprising at first to hear, but we have now several consistent observations um, really showing this very clearly. Um, there is an important implication in this, and that is that um, it is not just what happened, but what we make of it that really counts. Particularly, we know this very well now uh, with regard to psychopathology, but we're also researching uh, the implication for physical health. Uh, so we may be able to use and improve psychological intervention then to reduce the impact of ACEs on health. Helen, can you tell us a bit more about how do ACEs impact individuals? Well, that's where it gets really fascinating because the impact of ACEs is so individual and some individuals seem to get away without any negative effects. And I think that's because there's been recent research showing really across the animal kingdom, of course, we are animals, that we are actually adapted to our physiology is adapted to stress. So, you know, we, we rebalance ourselves when we're stressed, even if the stress is very extreme. What we don't know is why and when that our stress adaptation systems can become overwhelmed. So really, the range of impacts can be from virtually no impact at all to things like post-traumatic stress disorder, if um, if ACEs happen in early life, um, attachment disorders like the attachment disorder where children don't want to seek and accept comfort, that's actually quite rare. And on the whole, we adapt. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Andrea, some services have started to routinely ask uh, people about their adverse childhood experiences. I just wondered if you could say something about the pros and the cons of such an approach. Absolutely. So th there are clearly um, advantages, so some pros. And of course, it's really important to engage um, in the narrative that people build 
um, to explain themselves and others, and therefore also talking about their adverse childhood experiences. It tells us about their worldview and how they react to it. Uh, it can help us build empathy, trust, understanding. Uh, so this discussion and being open in this discussion can be clearly advantageous. However, we have shown in a set of papers, um, the last one um, just earlier this year, um, that is dangerous to use simplistic screening methods to make um, risk prediction for individuals. And, and therefore then also allocate resources and intervention uh, for ACEs. So what the research shows is that groups of people um, with greater ACEs have also greater risk of negative outcomes. However, um, our ACE number is not our destiny, as we have said several times. Um, I mentioned this paper that was led by Jesse Baldwin um, at UCL now um, in JAMA Pediatrics earlier this year, where we have highlighted that there is much heterogeneity, many differences within each group, um, each, each group determined by ACEs number. So really building again on what um, Helen was saying, right? So there is um, there, there are a lot of differences within uh, groups uh, who have the same ACE number. So, for example, many of those who have four plus ACEs don't have poor um, health, and those will be false positives. Um, on the opposite side, many of those with low ACEs can develop poor outcomes, and those will be false neg negatives. Therefore, we cannot simply use ACEs or ACEs count to make individual risk prediction, uh, because the individual risk prediction would be really poor. So we need better computational methods uh, that we are currently trying to develop for it. Great, thank you very much. And now my final question to both of you really is, what are the implications of this body of research for practitioners and clinicians? Helen, perhaps I could start with you. So I would agree with Andrea that the whole ACEs literature should if anything, help us to be more compassionate and curious about our patients. But for me, there's a really big caveat. So our research has shown that people who've experienced ACEs are also much more likely than the general population to experience other mental health problems, which are probably heritable. So things like um, ADHD, for example. And so what we must be really careful of as clinicians is that a person's ACE history doesn't close us off to a, a holistic view of that individual. If a person has experienced adversity in early life, they deserve, in my view, an even more thorough mental health assessment. And we should also be open-minded to the possibility that they don't have trauma-related problems. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And Andrea, do you have any thoughts about the implications for practitioners? Absolutely. So I will start with echoing what Helen just said, that um, ACEs are not randomly distributed in the population. There are many reasons why some children and young adults will have high levels of ACEs. So it's really important to think about what the pre-existing vulnerabilities and risks are, because we need to address those to reduce the impact of ACEs as well. And more generally, I think, um, that the findings that we just described really warn us that more simple and perhaps more attractive narratives about childhood trauma may be inaccurate and hide the complexity that we must address to improve the lives of children and adults with high ACEs. Um, so we don't want to just leave it at their count, but we need to develop probably a, a more complex but a, a better description um, of their needs if we want to help. Brilliant. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you.